Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast here with Benji Nyson for perhaps the recap of the best race of this entire season. 260 k's long. You know what it is. Paris-Roubaix from Compagnia to Roubaix. 31 cobbled sectors. I don't know how many like kilometers of cobbles. The weather conditions were atrocious. Wampanoag, MVDP, Quickstep. They were the big favourites, as always, this show, supported by our show partner, Le Cole. But when it kicked off Benji, as expected, the fight for the break was pretty fierce, given the, what we saw yesterday in the women's race. Yes, certainly. And it was a few riders that tried to go off before the couple sections even started. And they were caught quite quickly. But then we saw something odd happen. And at first I thought, this doesn't look like a very echelon type behaviour, but then it felt like it was the wind that was creating a gap in the peloton and we had a uh, 27 man group go away from the front and when you've got a 27 man group going off the front before the couple sections even start then alarms should be going off with every team that is not in that group but we had quite a few teams involved the likes of a lot of sedawa tree riders but mayor sweeney and van der sande os for bora ballerine and the cleric for the Koenig quickstep afini rosen and van hoidong for jumbo visma we had jasper philipson your pick for the day on uh, the breakaway when it comes to Alpesen. We have Van Asbroek with uh, Israel, Skoins for uh, Trek Segafredo, Haller, Fred Wright for Bahrain. We're in half the list right now, so uh, I'm sorry for your ears. Van Avermaet, Kung, Bissiger, Carvalho, Lengen. Then three riders from uh, Ineos in this breakaway, which is uh, something that you often don't expect anymore in races like this, I feel like. Dole, Moscon, and Rowe. Florian Maitre, Derbich, Tanet, Siskevicius, the guy that had the goat. <laughs> finished like two, three years ago, probably like four years ago at this point, with basically being out of time limit, arrived at a closed velodrome, and they had to reopen it for uh, him to try and finish it. And uh, in the end, he also topped in the year after. So crazy stuff happened with this guy already. Nils Eikhoff, Walshite, Erviti, Jorgensen, and Mozzato. So 27 people. Which teams are not involved? Well, those are the following. We have Grupama not being in there, Arkea, Astana, probably one or two other teams that were not completely happy with this that put a rider up front. But I namely saw Arkea and Grupama do things because Grupama started chasing the second that Kung crashed out of the breakaway at a uh, roundabout. I uh, honestly did not 100% see how the crash was caused, but that was the first of many crashes for Kung today. Very unfortunate for the man. But what do you think? Large breakaway going away? What is the scenario that you see for you? Well, it's kind of different to what Quickstep normally do, isn't it? Normally, they would not allow a break with a former top 10 in Roubaix, Luke Rowe, Moscon. We know how good he is in classics and in poor conditions. We have lots. We have Jasper Philipson in there, extremely fast rider, and he rode a good race today. Lots of dangerous names. It wasn't like a five-man group that you can give seven minutes to with not real threats. So... We a change in tactics, or just maybe that's just how it played out with Quickstep having the men up the road and having men up the road with Quickstep having two, Yumbo Visma having two. It's an advantage until it's not, because then you're not chasing all day. <laughs> yeah, you have them there, and then the second they drop or have a mechanical or crash, then they're out. They're not in your group to pace. They haven't been pacing for you, and now your leaders, Van Art or Lampart, have to start pacing themselves. And we saw a bit of that later in this race, whereas. For Ineos, yeah, they got men up front. They threw men up front. Same with Lotto. And uh, I think it was a big advantage for someone like Vladimir Spengi. If you're not a big name or Sweeney or Bissiger or someone, you do get that freedom to get in the group. Same with Echoff as well. But, yeah, I just saw with Kung and Crashes and Bora as well. Bora pacing because they missed it. I think they weren't happy with the composition either. And they had Schachmann here as well, not Italian classics, somewhat odd. But, yeah, the race moved on and... I think the first cobbled sector, Benji, was there. That was still the status quo until then, right? Yes, certainly. And we didn't see too many crashes on the cobbled sections, the first three at least. No. And I was kind of surprised, but happy on the other end of that. But we did see uh, in the peloton already split ups kind of happening in the groups itself. We did not have a complete visual understanding of what was going on in the race at certain points from this point on was for like 50 kilometers but what became clear is that in the breakaway something happened causing four riders to get away that was Walshide, Roe, Eikhoff and Vermeersch. Vermeersch the uh, Lotto rider and not the Alpesin rider to be clear and uh, there's no other double riders for the other names so I don't need to uh, save those names but uh, four riders that 
you would expect to last quite long on a parkour like this. And the gap has gone up to like two minutes 50 at this point. So I'm yeah. like, okay, this is getting quite large. And these are not rookies. They're not waffles. So we should expect the Peloton waffles. to... Yeah, okay. Pancakes is used by other podcasts. So I have to do something else here. Come on. Um, when it comes to uh, the next couple sections, um, <laughs> it was... Well, that group splitting up again, but it was a uh, very weird, right? Because Ro was suddenly gone, and yeah, mechanical, I think, which we didn't yeah. know at the time. We we later found out he had a mechanical, but he looked so strong on the cobbles section. Same with Moscon; they'd been going through first. Volshide had crashed, but he stayed with them. Ekhov and Vermish, uh, the two young Ekhov, the under twenty three world champion, twenty nineteen, and Vermish. He saw at the U twenty threes this year. I think in a move, Kung b- behind Benji. Crashed for like the third time. Other FDJ riders had crashed. Sagan crashes through like some sort of aquaplaning section. His race seems to be over. Yeah. And so we just, yeah, we're just counting up these crashes. Quick Step had been, I hadn't really seen them. Then we all, we, suddenly we do see them in like the Van Aert MVDP favorites group with Stieber, Seneschal, Asgren, Lampart, Bert van Leeuwenberger. I think I'm not missing out anyone else there. But eventually, Echoff and Vermeersch go solo on that group. Not duo. <laughs> oh, true. They are. It's a definitional <laughs> issue there for me. <laughs> Benji speaks better English than me. Echoff and Vermeersch go in a group of two, 50, and they get 50 seconds on group two. And initially, Echoff sitting on, Vermeersch is doing most of the relaying. What do you, if you are the strongest, Benji, and this is like 100% hindsight is always going to apply to this, if you go solo, if you do actually have a, some semblance of legs, it seems to be the biggest advantage at this sort of conditions, Volscheid crashing, Kung crashing, Bohan crashing. If you just can take the cobbled sectors with nothing in front of you, if you have good legs, at least you're taking that risk out of the equation. Yeah, it certainly helps. And we saw at certain points that these two riders were not riding in each other's wheels at certain cobble sections. One was riding on the left side of the road, one on the other side, one next to the other. Uh, sometimes we saw one of them just go on the uh, side of the ditch and use that. And that's something you usually see in groups, yes. But with two riders, yeah, it's just a bit more special to uh, see their tactics and whether uh, they perhaps had that in mind, the potential uh, crashing of the other rider, because Walshide well, crashed and as a consequence, they were loose. So they know it can happen in a group because it just happened to their competitors in that breakaway. But um, at that moment... They had a solid lead, 2 minutes 50 still, and we started noticing that the rest of that initial breakaway was forming a smaller group, but still with the likes of a Philipson in the chasing group and so forth. And I think Van Osbroek as well, still in that chasing group, all on 50 seconds. And in the peloton, with 1 or 15 kilometers to go, we see Van Aert take control on one of the uh, double sections, and the group basically gets thinned down to like 10, 15 riders at this point. And like in previous years, like non- rainy muddy years the gate to hell is through it out and right now we're going 150 kilometers before the end with 10 to 15 riders that is outrageous and uh is it too early for van Aert to take on this stuff no i don't think so like the worst thing you want to have is quick step with multiple riders in the group and sitting fresh and being able to attack with like van leberger if he's not had to chase and burn up his legs so i, I don't mind van Aert being aggressive at all and staying in front. In fact, I, I thought if he went clear with MVP, that's a really good outcome for him because they'll relay. They're good in the technically. I just thought we saw Timo Rosen and Van Hoydonk in that group ahead, and then we were coming up to the really important cobbled sections. I don't know. I just it would have helped to have a, someone with him. He had Grotewagen for a time. Turnison maybe the plan was Turnison was going to be there, and he wasn't. So with no Turnison. You know, normally that would be a pretty good outcome uh, for them. But then uh, MVDP responded, Benji. It closed down by Kwiatkowski and then it all stopped again. Slow section in the race, bike change for Wild Fun Art. And we're coming up to True Darenberg. And this is where the race, like really important part of the race. Quickstep have had mechanicals galore already up to this point. They've had Asgren before Arenberg. Asgren, Seneschal, Lampard all have mechanicals, and I think only Stibar's left there. Uh, I don't know what it was. DI2, I think, for one of them, or, t- or flat tyres. We get into Arenberg. We can't see. They've taken the motos out in front of the, gar- out of the riders, and 
Van Aert, we see Solo. We're like, over the helicopter shot, I'm like, has he attacked? He was caught behind. Is that That's one of the saves of the season, Benji. It was like the Cancelar Sagan one. It was on a Quebec rider. I hope we can find this photo of it. Yeah, he saved it. But his positioning, is this something that he can't correct? Is it just – because surely he must know Aaron Burke coming up. Yeah, certainly he must know that it's coming up. And um, I felt like that was the case on multiple sections where Van Aert for – was a bit too far behind. Usually that's the stuff we see with Van der Poel, and that's the stuff we saw with Van der Poel on the initial starting uh, couple sections of the day. But on Ardenberg, you shouldn't be uh, in a uh, bad position going into it. But yeah, the rider ahead of him falls, and you said it, a cruci- excruciating save, like crazy. And I would in no way be able to save myself, and I'd be on the floor 100%. But he gets up, and well, he doesn't get down, so he's still riding. But he keeps on riding and he's on a gap of like, it's not even that much, but the fact is he has to like get back up to speed. And when you're being on cobbles and especially on a five-star sector like through Adenberg, you're not going to reach the speed that Van der Poel is hammering at the front of the group ahead because Van der Poel has decided that this is the moment for him to go. Perhaps he knows that Van Aert is behind, which is uh, a logical conclusion to then go and start hammering it a bit considering, uh, well, he's your competitor. So keep going, man. And um well, we had a bit of a chase going on, but it seemed like Fanard was one more dropping to the group behind him, but also was catching riders from the front. So he started having like two groups chasing each other. Then something happened in the first uh, group, right? A quick note on our show partner, Lacole. In time for Paris Roubaix, and given that one of their ambassadors, Johan Museo, is well noted at Roubaix, a classics legend, Lacole have brought out a Mapai Quickstep Lacole throwback jersey, which I think looks incredible. Lacole have been supporting the show since its inception last year. If you want to check that jersey out and any other kit from them, you can check it out at www.lacole.cc. Big thanks to Lacole for supporting the podcast. No, what happened in the first group? Oh, it's the crash uh, <laughs> of uh, Peterson. So, oh, uh, yeah, that was terrible. From Luke, So Luke Road had the mechanical, and yeah, he swings out across the road and just chops Mads Peterson on Arenberg, breaks, like there's a photo on Trek's Twitter, I think, breaks Peterson's front fork in half. Peterson's out of the race. So I was like, yeah, it's a bit of a shame to see that. And we saw something similar with Kopecky yesterday who, in attention, she's like trying to get to the right side of the road to get her thing changed and she – get her bike changed and she just crashes out another competitor. So, yeah, a bit of a shame to see that. But we see Benji ahead of uh, – with Van der Poel, who's sort of attacked and, and created a gap, Colbrelli, Bovin, Matteo Jorgensen. Who are these two, the last two riders? Remind the viewers or the listeners who Guillaume Bovin and Matteo Jorgensen are. Jesus Christ, I should have prepared for this one. When it comes to Bovin, we uh, know that he's Canadian champion. He was decent at Flanders last week. We mentioned him in the uh, in the podcast after the race that he came 17 van was quite a surprising result. But apparently he's uh, he's in good form right now because he was in the group with Crazy bloody form. macho van der Poel. And... Uh, well, that's a very strong performance. Now, he's running for Israel. I honestly uh, haven't seen outrageously great results all round from him. So this is definitely one of the best races, if not the best race of his entire career. But he has done quite decent in like Fomen Arden Classic is a race that he won. And I think it's the uh, only non-NC race that he ended up winning. He once got second in an Italian Classic. But yeah, this is just by far his best race of his career. 100%. And there's nothing else we can say about it. And it was noticeable already last week that it might be upcoming, knowing how well he did at Flanders. But still crazy. And the guy has a bit of a sprint. Guy can definitely do cobbles, apparently. And uh, yeah, a real surprise that he's there. Jorgensen, we know that he's uh, very talented. But in all honesty, I did not expect him to be there either. He seems to have a wet weather buff at Tour de la Provence in that weird up <laughs> yeah. sprint. He was really good. Maybe he's just he's a young American. He's really hard to classify what sort of rider he is right now. He's very versatile, um, as Benji said. But yeah, Van Aert did close back that Matthew van der Poel group. I'm not sure the others, they weren't too willing to pull Hausler was back as well, mate. Come on, <laughs> announce it. <laughs> Hausler Hashtag announce Hausler. <laughs> Benji was getting the spray paint ready for his hair. Stiebar was back, although he didn't look as good as Van Aert at all, and he was already put on a cap when Van Aert was closing it. And so eventually, Colbrelli went solo out of a group that wasn't functioning too well. There was a bit of a lull in the race with maybe 92 to 75 k's to go. So, yeah, Colbrelli went solo, 
He got 40 seconds and caught up to Yanni Vermeer, oh, not Yanni Vermeer, <laughs> Florian Vermeer, and Niels Ekhoff. And had Moscon, where was Moscon at that point, Benji? Was he still in the, the group behind? In the, still this group yep. of breakaway people like the remnants of, we didn't even know who was in there. There was Philipson, I think. We yep. had Isiger, some other riders as well, Baptist Plankart, all st- still Rosen and Van Hooydonk. But we also saw that uh, the two Yumbo riders both crashed and then had a mechanical, which is a big problem for Van Aert after Groenewegen dropped as well. And then MVDP had a bike change, lots of mechanicals. The next big action was in Tiloy, Assas et Rosier. MVDP attacks in the saddle. Lampart follows and then gets dropped by MVDP, who was taking the corners ridiculously well. Who else and was he- following? Hausler tried to. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> well, he he did it for a bit. Come on, give him credit. Give him credit, man. For a bit, he tried to follow. But what did you think of MVDP's strategy here, Benji? With Philipson up the road, animating the race, it's the way he likes to race. I guess he knew that Van Aert was under pressure, and Van Aert was having to chase behind. With you know, he had about a thirty-four, thirty-six second gap on them. I think he uh, he actually looked like he was trying to use his technique to try and attack better than sure. other people because he was. For his attack, before he attacked, he was moving up on the right side and was taking the inner corner while all the other riders are just going slower around the bend. And that is just an ability that gives him so much because he instantly had like 10 meters on people. It took quite a bit for other people to join him again, those three riders that tried to follow him, but he just dropped them on the same cobble section once again. So outrageous attack from that point onwards. And I was expecting, okay, Philipson's at the front. What is he going to do? Is he going to call back Philipson? Will they wait until they get... Well, a bit further in the race, will they try and have Vanderpool close it down himself? And I didn't really know what was going to happen, which one they were going to choose, but I also wasn't sure how much energy Philipson still had in that second group. And then we also saw that at the front, Floyd Andre Mierz and Ekov were actually getting caught. So by that, like, chasing group once again. And then eventually we would still have attacks from that group from that point onwards. But, uh, yeah, we had Vanderpool on the chasing and Wout van Aert was outpositioned on that cobble section. Do you think that, yeah, we just mentioned already, it was a mistake already on Adam Berg, but yeah, once again, and it is costing him. It looked like he was trying to go onto the right side of the road and pass people to try and react, but just way too far behind, you know? Yeah, and it has a sort of uh, a domino effect. Arenberg is where it all starts to go wrong for Van Aert, and then he's you're always on the back foot after that. There's limited time to move up before the next sector. You've you've burnt energy where other riders have been on in the front. You're having to move around other riders, avoid crashes, avoid spectators, avoid the cars, the motorbikes. The motorbikes crash so many times today. Everyone already, everyone is completely brown and muddied. We have it's very difficult to see who is who, and we. Lampard has another mechanical. Suddenly, we see Gianni Moscon, who's in a group with, I think, Florian Vermeersch and Tom Van Asbroek. Moscon goes solo. He'd been better than, than them on the cobbles, the cobbles sections, goes clear, and those two, I believe, go back into the breakaway group, which had a Philipson, MVDP, Guillaume Bovin, and a few other riders. And we just know at this point, MVDP is going to follow try and get people to work with him, which they did. Colbrelli uh, relayed a bit. Bovin relayed only when they'd caught up to the Van Asbrook group. He started work. He'd been sitting on MVDP and Colbrelli to bridge across. Would you work if you're Bovin? Mm, I don't know. I don't know what the plan was. Maybe that was – isn't Van Asbrook supposed to be quick? Like, was he like, I'll work for Van Asbrook now? I don't know. No, I don't not really. know what the plan was. I think that they were just trying to survive as long as possible and hoping that one of them makes it till the end. <laughs> so, exactly and then we from that group we have Gianni Moscon he gets a gap of a minute 25 on that group which uh, I've got to say MVDP's looking a bit tired he's already accelerated like a lot of moves to bridge across it as I say he's bridged from the basically the Van Aert group to the breakaway Van Aert's at a minute 50 in that group and there's no real multiple teammates there he's pulling with Lampart they really couldn't catch up or gain any traction at all they kept losing time and Gianni Moscon with 31 Ks to go, looking really good. A minute 25 gap has a flat tire. Looked like a slow leak. The cameras almost caught it before he did. Looking, They zoomed in on his back tire. Has a flat. Changes his bike. Four Ks later, has a crash on the cobble section 10 Ks before Carrefour de Labra. And you can see, I don't know, maybe I'm guessing, 
the bike pressure in his tires mm-hmm. they just seemed to he just seemed to be much less comfortable on the cobbles uh both before that crash and afterwards on the new bike and maybe the pressure was a lot higher i'm not sure and then he loses another 30 seconds so he's now 100 percent going to be caught by the mvdp called brelli bovin uh vermish group because he's only entering car forward lab with a 50 second or you know sorry a 15 second lead and now that's bridgeable for mvdp yeah what did you see from car forward lab or benji with mvdp attacking and then i guess colbrelli even almost countering him once they caught moscon yeah it seemed like Van der Van der Poel was going straight from the start, like you mentioned, straight from the start of Carfoot Larbra. Seemed like he was waiting a tiny bit before to save some energy so that he could do it his own Carfoot Larbra because they were keeping Moscow on 10 seconds ahead for quite a bit there. So I was expecting them to catch them on the Carfoot Larbra cobble section. And then the unfortunate thing happens. Well, um, well Van crashes out of that out of that group with Colbrelli. And that's really unfortunate because uh, I am an outsider fan. So we have uh, the following riders left. That is Van der Poel, Colbrelli. And we have Florian Vermeers, still able to follow. Absolute mad lad. And they catch up with Moscon on the section. And even before we get to the end of this section, Moscon has dropped and is like 10 to 20 meters behind. We had the third group with, well, Boivin, who's also just ages behind already because of that crash. And then behind that, a minute behind the front of the race, we had Van Aert group with Hauser, still in the race, of course, because yeah. Hauser is an absolute legend. But um, it was clear that one of the three riders at the front was going to win this year's Paris Roubaix in my eyes, unless they did a Moscon and punctured and crashed as a consequence in the following uh, five kilometers. But um, I was expecting stuff to happen. And then you look at their abilities because we've got Garfoot Library done. What is left? We've got Brusson. We have Hem. We don't have the biggest couple sections anymore. They're fast so sections. Who's going to attack each other? And I'm like, can Vermeer sprint? And we started looking it up. Well, fourth in a Brussels Cycling Classic, which was behind the likes of Buhani, Merlier. So that's a solid bloody sprint. And then we look at the Vuelta, where he is able to sprint to a top 10. So his sprint is not outrageously good, but he has an opportunity here. And I'm starting to think that he might just bet on his sprint. And then we look at Van der Poel and Colbrelli. And Colbrelli is a note singer, man. He's that... He's that rider that's like, okay, there's a lot of Sudel rider here. I have no clue who the fuck that is because I can't <laughs> see his face, nor would yeah. I know it otherwise. No because way he knows I have who no he clue. <laughs> exactly. Well, because I have no clue who this rider is. And he's like, against Vanderpool, this guy might attack from behind us. Okay. He's saying that to Vanderpool. Oh, I'm just imagining a conversation, but it looked like he was saying that. Okay. And they started still rolling in. And Vermeer did a bit less turns from the start, to be honest. And you were starting to potentially bring up the idea of he's a young guy would he go just for the podium and keep on riding but i i thought like nah why the fuck would you do that (laughs) well because moscon was toast and he was way behind like they had a pretty pretty good buffer because that van arkrig although we weren't getting time gaps whenever they showed them they literally like was Jonas roots just dangling on the front meme attacking and as you said, he's quick. I was surprised to see Benji in the last three Ks, Vermeer's throw in a dig, immediately marked by Colbrelli. And I was thinking, is Colbrelli, you know, beaten by Valgren in the sprint the other day? I've been not Col- in the Benelux store. Yeah, is Colbrelli <laughs> going to rely on his sprint here? Would, would he go solo? He'd thrown a dig at MVDP on Carford Lambra. MVDP is the better sprinter on paper, but. MVP didn't react, and MVP said afterwards he wasn't feeling good with 30 Ks to go. I was just surprised with the Vermeer's attack. I think he had the element of surprise being the underdog, and it was a bit like the Crone effect in the Catalonia Stage 1, although these you know, couldn't be two different races. And so they, they go to the velodrome together, MVP leading on the front with Vermeer laying off behind. You just know he's going to have a big dig behind, like, long ranger try and catch them napping Colbrelli's constantly looking at him and Vermeer goes with 200 meters to go boxes MVDP in a little bit who then can't get out and Colbrelli comes in onto Vermeer's slipstream they then pass Moscon who's doing his second to last lap forces them out wider Colbrelli comes around the outside of Vermeer in the sprint and beats him by nearly a bike length winning Paris-Roubaix MVDP third behind Vermeer Bam for Sonny Colbrelli winning Roubaix Benji. Um, the first time he's ever done it. 
all the yeah. podium, the first time they've ever done Roubaix. What do you say to – who do you think was the strongest in the race? And do you – I think Colbrelli and Bahrain played a pretty tactically astute race here uh, from the get-go. I think so as well. And they could have had even more of a, an extra – boosts when Haller actually punctured from the breakaway at the start of the race on one of the first cobble sections. So if that doesn't happen, then, uh, well, you've got a, a better situation because Haller is certainly worthy of having in the breakaway as well and could have helped quite long knowing what he did at RVV. But looking more at the sprint, I feel like we're missing one detail that shows how clever Colbrelli was thinking during the sprint. And we're going into the part just before Vermeer's launches. And we see that they're going through one of the corners of the velodrome. And Cobrelli sees that he's in the wheel of Vanderpool. And Vermeer is at the back. We know from Paris Roubaix 2016, the darkest day in Belgian history, that when we have a sprint that happens, when Heyman is launching at the front, when Bonin is in his wheel, Van Mark started closing in Bonin by riding right next to him. And Bonin couldn't attack anymore. True. And Cobrelli fought. That's not going to happen to me today, mate. And luckily for him as well, Van der Poel went a bit to the middle of the road and wasn't necessarily uh, hugging the left side of the road anymore. And Colbrelli decided, I'm going to ride next to him because I've got a better opportunity to respond to every single one of the two if I ride next to him instead of staying in the wheel of Van der Poel and being boxed in by Vermeer here. And Vermeer does make that move quite early, but I also think that it's quite natural for a guy, what is he, 22 or something, that he's likely not going to uh, have a complete confidence of sprinting against Van der Poel and Colbrelli because those are guys with a, a reputation when it comes to sprinting. Vermeer's, he topped end of Vuelta stage. Like, I understand that he doesn't completely trust that. But in hindsight, what if he doesn't attack and goes for the sprint completely? And I think he could have won Paris Roubaix. But I don't want to say that completely because the guy rode a fantastic race, an absolutely beast of a race. And every single one of the three, to be honest, Van der Poel lit up the race very early, was attacking even before we got to the uh, Trui Dardenberg already, and kept on attacking, and was the rider that lit up the race for me personally. And Colbrelli, some people are criticizing him because he didn't ride as much as Van der Poel, but let's be honest. He went solo at a point. Yeah, also, but also in this race, it's, it's cycling. Cycling is a sport when you, where you want to try and win. It's not always about riding at the front most of the time of the race, like it's not always clever to do that. And Cobrelli is more tactical on that end and riding more tactical during the race than Van der Poel is in my eyes. And as a consequence, it's not surprising that he has more energy at the end to uh, have a proper sprint happening. Van der Poel, it seems like his initial acceleration when Vermeer went past him, I'm not 100% sure that he was actually blocked in because I felt like he, he was wasn't. riding next to Cobrelli. He was And, okay. And Vermeer launches and it looked like he didn't have that initial kick. And it, it took a bit before he actually got to speed to be able to try and get past Vermeer again. And I think he might have uh, he stuffed lost the velodrome. it. Yeah. I think he didn't put himself in the best spot in the velodrome. Just watching it. I don't know any mathematicians out there. I did the Pythang with Christoph <laughs> the other day at Arctic Race or wherever it was. But MVDP had to go the long way around here because of Moss gone as well. And then... Vermeer shifts out, and then Colbrelli shifts out. The MVPs have to go a long way. He then started at the front, slow pacing. He gets up to speed in no one's draft as well. Does he still win if he gets it all right? Probably not. I actually think Vermeer is the man. Vermeer did a twenty full 20-second sprint, Benji. That's a long time at the end of Roubaix to do a 20-second sprint. I know he's, he was going for a, a Heyman-style sprint, but his initial kick I'm watching – it, his initial kick really got Colbrelli. It's really strong. Yeah, it really got them <laughs> off. And it's actually the the endurance of Colbrelli being able to keep going that gets him back and then over the top of Vermeer. But Vermeer put bike, a couple of bike links into them initially. So um, this is, you know, I'm not criticizing the young kid that came third at Roubaix in his first attempt. I'm just saying I think he was good enough to win today and he maybe – yeah, but anyway, he'll have more opportunities to come. But here's the final top 10. Colbrelli first, Vermeer second, Van der Poel third, all debutants at Roubaix, then Moscon, Lampard, Laporte, teammate of Van Aert next year, Van Aert, Van Aspruk, Bovin, and House. So the favourite, Benji, uh, Van Aert for today. I mentioned Laporte. Do you think teammates are the issue? What do you think is the take-home message for Van Aert here? 
is it just that he's just not as good as MVP straight up in classics like this, or is it timing, teammates, etc.? I think the question is the one that we need to ask, or he needs to ask because we can't answer it for him, is whether the out positioning on the couple of sections where he got into trouble, the one where Vanderpool attacked, was because he didn't have it anymore, or because he was just not attentive enough. And I'm I'm scared to say that it might have been the first part. I'm not a hundred percent sure whether he had everything to make today his day. And therefore I just think that he wasn't good enough today. Personally, I we can talk about the positioning quite a lot, but yeah, it's it's clear that he wasn't able to respond swiftly. He didn't go past people or was able to go past people, I would expect, in the group when Van der Poel was attacking. So it wasn't like he was instantly responding. If you have the energy, you're going to try and fly past people and respond when Van der Poel attacks, you know? So that's at least how I see it. But um, it's yeah, weird too. sure. I think his team was... Also not at the strongest that it could be, but I think they also had a, a Feeney puncturing out of the breakaway. Yeah. Um, so that's not ideal either, but I would have expected more from Tunison. I personally didn't see Ankhorn, but I heard he abandoned the race. I don't know whether that was due to a crash or just... He paced he a was... little bit, really early. Okay. Um, Timo Dawson paced quite a bit in like chasing with the Van Aert group, but yeah, he came from the breakaway, so he spent some energy already. And in the end, this is a very... Uh, attrition based race and we see then then we see that then that i can't even talk anymore it's such <laughs> a long race it's insane i watched from start to finish uh and we had um philipson who was doing exactly the same thing that rosen was doing for van Aert, uh for van der Poel and being a bit of a satellite rider up front perhaps on purpose perhaps accidentally but uh philipson didn't have much to help out van der Poel either so it kind of felt like the race was too hard for the breakaway to 100% be strong enough to help out the people uh, that were coming from behind, except for like Florian Vermeer, who just had an outstandingly strong day. But I feel like we got to talk a bit more about the winner today because this man has had an outrageous season. Yeah. And it started quite early on with the likes of a top five at Hand Wevelhem in that group, top 10 at Milano San Remo, top six at Kuno Sukuna. Sure, perhaps he was aiming for more, but. He doesn't always have a great, like, Flanders uh, classics, races, and so forth. Uh, Palmares, I feel like. I feel like he's always, like, just too short to be in uh, the group that is getting away in previous years. And that was, again, the case in the Tour of Flanders, certainly. But they had Holler taking care of things then in that race. But it really started with that stage when in Roman the that we covered on the pod. We had Dauphiné, where he started dominating, except for the fact that he had that last man that he needed and required for uh, the sprints that he was missing, and therefore he ended like second, I think three times or something. An Italian champion, and this was an outrageous race because he did that on a hilly parkour and dropped Masnada on one of the climbs, if I recall correctly. So that day we knew that it's climbing sprinty boy mode from this point onwards, and right now it's not climbing sprinty boy mode anymore, it's climbing gobbly sprinty boy mode. And we're going to have to think about just a shorter name if he starts winning time trials as well <laughs> yeah. next year. Uh, Cole Burley's been a pro rider since 2012, I think, on Carl Nago CSF Bardiani. He's 31. He, before this year, two World Tour level wins at Tour de Suisse and Paris Nice back in 2017. The last was in 2018. This year, now five World Tour level wins, including GC at Benelux and the win at Paris Bay, the first time he's ever done it. I've always. It's a, a huge improvement now, fifth best rider in the world by PCS ranking. I do think his his race selection has been terrible up to this year. And it's, you know, he, to not have done Roubaix or even I more was thinking to not have done the Vuelta, he always goes to the Tour. He went to the Tour this year where I don't think the stages suit him as much as the Giro or the Vuelta, so he doesn't yeah. even have a, he doesn't have a Grand Tour stage win either, which is crazy for a rider of of this caliber. Or maybe it is Benji that he just needs a really really hard and long race. Um, yeah, but he did have like I think bad luck was it 2015 Giro d'Italia where he got I remember a stage where he got second because another rider just passed him in the last 300 meters or something, but I can't find it because I'm absolutely blind apparently. So, um, yeah, perhaps I'm just dreaming it. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's something that 
I uh, keep in mind, certainly, but he has not moved too much around in teams either. Like he was at Bardiani and just went to Bahrain. Was it the year that it started 2017? I think it was. So it seemed like they finally found a, a schedule that fits him and still it's not the ideal uh, ground tour like you mentioned. So has he missed out on a lot of races in the past few years, you think, based on his race schedule? For sure, Montalcino. Imagine him in the break there, Benji. Like, yeah. like at Montalcino this year, the Giro, like a Mauro Schmidt won that stage. I mean, Cobrelli would be lethal there. So, yeah, um, I think it's – I don't know what it is. At Bahrain, he's always seemed to have done the tour. It's very surprising to me. Uh, but then, yeah, his second half of the season here, he's won Coppa Agostini, Coppa Sabatini, fourth at Grand Premier, Bruno Bigelli, first at Trey Valley Varacin. No, I'm looking at 2016. I've lost the plot as well. We've been sitting watching the racing since 11 o'clock when now we're just reading straight up incorrect PCS stats to people. Gianni Moscon, Benji, but I want to talk about Quick Step in a second. Moscon, I think he definitely lost a chance to win today, definitely lost a podium chance with the mechanicals and the crash. He might not have won solo. They might have caught him, but I think they would have caught him with like five, seven Ks to go after the cobbles. And like what a ride from him today. Incredibly impressive. Off to Astana next year. That's the sort of classics buff that team really needs. Yeah, I think you jinxed it for this year, by the way, or me. Because like I call that like 40k to go that Moscon was winning today, and then like a few minutes later he ended up having that puncture. But then again, I blame you for the ultimate jinx because you uh, in January said on the Ineos <laughs> podcast that this man would be podium a uh, a, a monument, monument this year. Yep. and fourth he got fourth. <laughs> what a terrible take! Fourth after crash and mechanical. He's doing Solar. Lombardia still, so there is an opportunity still. Mate, you know? Lombardia with Remco, Remco, Pagaccia, Roglic, <laughs> and probably Cobrelli win that now. Um, <laughs> He's not riding it apparently. Cobrelli. <laughs> Quick step, not a good Roubaix from their perspective. Benji, I was very, very high on Quick Step. Uh, one so, rider in the top ten, and then the next best, uh, Stibar at twenty sixth. I just think, uh, is there anything that could have changed? Uh, see, Asger and De Klerk, Seneschal finishing 20 minutes down. Uh, or is it the just... tire brand? Yeah. They had a lot of punctures with their team, so I guess that could have changed quite a thing. But uh, on a serious note, I was getting punctured. I think that Lampard had a puncture as well. I recall Seneschal having a, was it a real wheel puncture or was it a front wheel puncture? I think you said it just before the podcast started, but it seems like looking at your face that you completely forgot which puncture it was, it was <laughs> right? Yeah, I just know that those guys before every pivotal cobble section pretty much they were off the back inexplicably. Like when Asgren was there, he was on the front pulling quite well and then suddenly disappeared. So, well, Lombard still came up quite close, you know, because ending like fifth. He chased back. Like a lay bridge that would have been a big gap to that group and then to come fifth and he was pulling. It was pretty impressive from Lampard. So, he beat yeah, Laporte in a sprint and Wild for not. Yeah, exactly. And he beat uh, pretty comfortably as well. Any other funny things or notable things today, Benji? Uh, poor old Seb van Mark, mechanicals, crashes. Whenever the camera cut to him, he'd like, get back on. Camera showed him, he'd then crash, have a mechanical. Any other things like that that you uh, want to point out from this race? GVA's pain face? Yeah, GVA's pain face definitely exists. He also actually crashed out of that front group and was looking pretty good throughout the race itself. So you never know what could have happened if he stayed up. But it seemed that the first few couple sections that he was already like, trying to ride 20 meters behind everybody because he seemed a bit scared when he comes to the road surface. And I can't blame him looking at how the roads were today, despite there not being as many crashes as I would have expected it, luckily. Um, but one thing I do want to mention is that at a certain point in the race, we saw a guy from Cofidis who started braking with his foot on his back tire. Laporte. W- w- how? Why? <laughs> Because his brake didn't work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, just for old school memes. It was great stuff to see like that. Hopefully, comment down below if you're watching or tweet at us, what were your memorable moments from Roubaix? The, the things that you only see in Roubaix, that is one of them. Christophe Laporte using his back Housler. foot to brake. Hausler just appearing out of nowhere on MVP's wheel. Definitely had Benji scared for a while. I got a little bit excited about Philipson for a while. But yeah, we're super excited. We will have a preview of Lombardia, the next monument coming up. Uh, we might do a little, 
don't know. We'll see what pods we'll have in the week. There was obviously Emilia yesterday, which was a crazy good race between Roglic, Pogaccia, Avon Paul, Almeida, as well as uh, Mike Woods. But yeah, that's all from us regarding Paris-Roubaix, a, a memorable edition. I'll have the highlight video up when I, once I gather my thoughts. Benji and I are still in a little bit of shock. But yeah, who was your favorite rider of the day? Who do you like for next year? Is Vermeersh the next Dillier or is he the next Tom Bonin? There can be only two <laughs> only two polarities. There's nothing in well, between. <laughs> I think he's not like any of them personally because the guy can actually time trial decently. But if I have to make a prediction, he's Belgian, so he's clearly going to uh, have a better career than Dillier at the moment. Then again, Dillier had a, like, uh, quite a bit of injuries, so kind of feel bad saying that personally but nonetheless i do feel that this is not a one-trick pony idea we said at the start of the year or we mentioned it on the uh lotto sedal podcast that we were expecting something from him again it was like top 10 flanders that i was expecting but apparently it's top three in uh roubaix close enough i guess but <laughs> all in all it's uh awesome to see that happen and it's cool to see that belgium's got some talent then if i recall correctly this guy was riding the u23 world championships last week yeah, I know. Everyone everyone got mad at Schmidt for st- sandbagging, but um, yeah, <laughs> he was there as well, which is just crazy, and he didn't win. So that obviously means that Gurmai could have won today if he started. Uh, I would have loved to see UNOX here as well, but that's all from us on Paris-Roubaix. We've enjoyed it a lot this weekend, an incredible weekend of racing for the first women's edition and now the men's today. Hopefully, I personally think they should keep it separate next year so you can fo- we can focus on both of the races in full. Yeah, and until- then I, uh, oh, I don't need to uh, wake up that early if it's in the morning, for example. True, exactly. Uh, that hurts. Like La course. La course is on at 11 a.m. It's very difficult to watch, uh, or it finishes 11 a.m. rather. But, yeah, until whatever we cook up during the mid- middle of the week, follow us on Twitter for details of that. See you.